Hello, it's time for another sociology lecture up here in my very hot attic. Oh my god, it's hot. But it's never too hot for hot coffee. Hey everybody, we're going to do a little short lecture, I think short, on groups, uh, the sociology of group and group dynamics, small group dynamics. So we'll see how much we can get through this. And we talked about groups um, when we were talking about the elements of society. Remember, we talked about roles, status, groups, and institutions. And so we talked about, the, you know, defining groups as a collection of people interacting in an orderly way on the basis of shared expectations. Um, groups can have their own norms and values. Um, and I think what we talked about in our, when we brought this up in our last discussion was the notion that we usually think about groups as primary groups. The primary group is the small, intimate group that you spend most of your time with, which these days is whoever you're locked up with. <laughs> That'd be small. Some people, it's like a group of one. One is the loneliest number. Um, but, you know, what your, your ethnic group or your, uh, your work group or your kind of like subculture uh, but we can also have secondary groups. We have groups that sort of we temporarily belong to, like fans at a show, um, uh, you know, me people at a political rally and things like that. The, the class, you know, if you're in a classroom, that's a secondary group. And on any day, uh, you know, our interaction in involves both primary and secondary groups. Sometimes we have to change our behavior and our expectations and the way that we dress based on which group we're in. So if you think about going from hanging out with friends to going to work. Uh, there's a new set of rules. There's a new set of expectations. So what I wanted to talk about today is the notion of small group dynamics and how small groups uh, have their own sort of life and structure to them. So this is really based on the research of a famous French sociologist named George Zimmel. And Zimmel was a sociologist in the late 1800s and early 20th century when uh, one of the popular things before well, bars have always been popular, but one of the popular things in this period of Paris were the, was the salon. And what the salon is, in a hair salon, is in a nail salon. Salon were people's living rooms, basically, where people would go on a Saturday night with a couple bottles of wine and have conversations about a particular topic. Hey, there's a salon tonight at George's house, and we're going to talk about, you know, the true notion of freedom. So people would get together and drink and have have these great conversations. It was before television, right? So the idea of conversation as a form of entertainment was very alive and well in Paris in the, the late 1800s. So uh, those were the days. I hope people are having good conversations now. I hope they aren't just like, eh, what's on Hulu? Um, yeah. So anyway, Zimmel uh, was really interested in um, the salons. And he would, you know, he did some sort of laboratory studies based on the the, the salons, and it was really interested in the impact of of the, of group size. This is all about group size. So I'm going to have to flash some images up here. I'm just realizing I should have brought my little chalkboard up here. It's been a while since I used it. Um, that when you think about what's the smallest group, and by the way, uh, George Zimmel was rediscovered uh, when a TV show called Survivor became very popular, and hopefully. When I go through this discussion, if you're a Survivor fan, you'll be able to see the connection. Uh, that the smallest group that you have is two is two people, what he called a dyad. A dyad is just two people, and they have intense face-to-face -face interaction. And I should say that groups are formed around a goal. There's some goal. There's some work goal. There's some leisure goal. Let's have fun. Let's make a plan. Let's get this job done. Let's fix this bridge. You know, whatever it is, there's some type of goal that that is why a group exists. There's some goal behind it. And if you think about two people, the best way to get a job done is to put two people on it. And why? Because they hold each other's feet to the fire. You know that saying? You know, they, there's no free riders. That they, You know, if there's one person you can kind of slack off and I'll do it tomorrow. But if you've got a group with another person, like, oh, I can't slack off because they'll think I'm a slacker, so I need to work. So you get two people into the, a group and they sort of force each other to work. And it's the ideal group. And people who are like corporate bosses know that the best way to get anything done is to put two people on a job. Not say, hey, Smith, right? I need a report on pig swell by Tuesday. But if you get two Smith and Jones on it, like, oh, all right, we've got to make sure that we get this thing done. So two people is sort of the ideal group. A third person added to that group, three people, is called a triad. 
And three people start to get interesting. And this is where it gets a little survivory. Because when you have three people, you get political. You can have two people ganging up on the third one. Because when it's two, it's face-to-face -face interaction. When it's three, two of them might say, yeah, I think we're on the same page here, but Frank, our third wheel, doesn't get it. Let's just squeeze him out. And so you start getting these sort of alliances. That's the, the line that you would know from Survivor, where two people are kind of in it together and have a little bit of advantage over the third person. So things start to get a little bit complicated when you get three in a triad. Then you add four, right? Then it gets even more interesting, because think about all the way the lines connect. There are multiple alliances, and it gets even more complicated. And then five, you know, all of a sudden you get exponential number of potential alliances and it starts to get really confusing. And what he found studying these salons and doing these sort of studies in labs is that once you get to 10 people, it's too much. You can't, the job doesn't get done. There's too much drama going on and on. And 10, in groups of 10 or more, which is 10 to 10,000, you need a leader. A leader is someone who keeps you on task. Like this is the goal that we have to meet. Uh, and so that dynamic uh, of 10 or more needing a leader is very important in our daily lives. One of the most important ways is um, on juries, right? You have a jury. How many are on jur in, in a jury? 12, right? you got 12 people on a jury, and they have a goal to figure out if this person is innocent or guilty, or you can't figure it out, right? Innocent or guilty, or, you know, we don't have enough information to figure it out. 12 people in a room can be like, la, 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 and, you know, they're never getting the job done. There's too much infighting. There's too much, you know, dividing. They need a leader. They need a jury foreman or a jury four woman or a jury four person to say, hey, we need to focus on this particular issue. On this particular issue, is there enough evidence? Or I'm going to take a vote. Innocent or guilty? Let's hang this guy or set him free. Uh, and so that is really dynamic, right? You think about the Supreme Court, you know, and how it has to make these decisions. Right, it has a leader. John John Roberts is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His job is to keep these knuckleheads in order. I don't know if you heard about the um, recent Supreme Court Zoom meeting in which one of the Supreme Court justices uh, used the toilet. Somebody flushed the toilet. Talk about studied non-observance. Nobody acknowledged um, that somebody had used the toilet. But you know, they're the Supreme Court anyway. Uh, this group of 12 uh, or needs a leader. Like, they couldn't get it done. There's an amazing movie about a jury called 12 Angry Men. It's a Henry Fonda movie, and it all takes place inside a jury room. And it's fascinating about how dynamic a jury can be uh, and how important it is to have that one person uh, to sort of bring it back to the task at hand. There are also, when we look at these small groups, 12 or more, that need a leader, there are different types of leadership styles that emerge. Different ways that you can be. You can be very authoritarian as a leader. You can be laissez-faire, sort of laid back. Uh, you can kind of go for the vibe. Uh, we do this a lot in um, you know, faculty meetings. It's called rule by consensus. Does everybody think we're okay? Do we, do we need to take a vote? Or is it just like everybody's like, yeah, let's, okay. I mean, sometimes it's just like that, looking around the room. When I'm teaching a class, um, in a physical place, you'll be like, do we need a break? Do, you know, we need a break. And you know, I don't have to take a vote. Do we need a break? You just sort of look around the room and you feel like, yeah, you think you need to, you know, there are different ways. And so, um, Zimmel talks about two types of leaders that emerge. The first is the instrumental leader. The instrumental leader is focused on the goal. This is what we got to do. We got to get this done. We got to make this thing. So if you think about Survivor, often at the beginning, because Survivor works backwards, right? You start with a bunch of people and you whittle it down to a one person left standing. But you, you want a leader, uh, and the leader will say, okay, you're going to go get food, you're going to go get firewood, you're going to build a shelter, it's like to do division of labor type stuff and really focus on the goal. That's one type of leader, um, the instrumental leader. The other is the expressive leader. The expressive leader is focused more on, not the goal, goal is still important, but making sure that everybody gets along, to create harmony within the group, to kind of keep everybody working together. Traditionally, these two uh, leadership styles, the instrumental goal, let's get it done, and the expressive style, is everybody okay, is everybody doing all right, have been gendered. That we've seen the instrumental style as more male, and the expressive style as more female. They don't have to be connected to men and women. When the two leading Democratic candidates for President of the United States 
were Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, a female, and Senator Barack Obama, a male. And a lot of feminists said, well, we need to vote for the woman because we need to have a female president. But a lot of other feminists said, no, we need to vote for Obama because he's got more of a feminine style. He's more of an expressive leader. That Clinton is more of a traditional male instrumental leader. And if we really want to change patriarchal power, it's not about, you know, what if they're actually male or female. It's about how they reinforce male power, the instrumental, you know, goal oriented or the expressive female. And so there was a real split in a lot of fem I mean, as a feminist in 1988, I felt like I was obligated um, to vote for Barack Obama, <laughs> even though that's who I wanted to vote for. I felt like that was actually the better vote to change patriarchy than a woman who, you know, bragged about how much she wanted to bomb Iran, uh, which Hillary Clinton did. Um, and so there is, um, there is this dynamic that happens in these groups. So I want to talk, speaking of dynamics, I want to talk about something that sort of happens uh, in these groups. Um, there is something called groupthink that can happen in a group. That when, we're, when we have a small group and everybody is oriented towards the goal of getting the job done, that sometimes people, um, because the responsibility is diffused by all the members of the group, will know that there might be something wrong but won't say anything. So the phrase is, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to rock the boat. I knew I, I should have said something. Like I, I had a feeling that that guy was innocent, but everybody else seemed to think that he was guilty. I mean, this is why 12 Angry Men is like the best movie ever. Because there's one guy, not to give anything away, spoiler. There's one guy, Henry Fonda, is like, I know you all think this guy's innocent or guilty, but let me tell you why I think he's innocent. But usually that one person will be like, Everybody else seems like they're going along. And there's been some great research to sort of back this up, including this research by Solomon Ash on group conformity, um, who did Solomon Ash's experiments, looked at sort of groups of these small groups, and usually it was college students, a group of seven to nine college students, and would have them sit in a circle and look at these cards with different length lines on them. And they had to uh, say which line was the longest or which line was the shortest. The thing was, in those nine member groups, eight of them were working for the researcher. They were Confederates. So we're talking about an experimental setting here, right? Only one of them was the subject. And when they would pass the cards around and all the Confederates would purposely lie and say, you know, line B is the longest when clearly it's line A, and it would get to the subject and the subject would be like, uh... Line B is the longest because everyone else said line B and they didn't want to be the odd one out. So those Solomon Ash um, um, conformity studies kind of reflect the, the, what can go wrong in a group, what can go wrong in a small group. So there's this concept of, of groupthink where you just sort of go along with the group. You don't want to rock the boat. And the example of this that we always talk about now as where this can horribly go wrong is the Challenger disaster of 1986. So let me set the stage because I don't think anybody here was... Here in 1986, I certainly was. Uh, the space program in the 1960s was awesome. 50 years ago, we were putting people on the moon. I mean, it was just a, an amazing experience. And people got a little bit tired of it. It got a little bit boring. Oh, yeah, go to the moon. You go to the moon. Apollo 17 was the last one, right? Apollo 11 first. Apollo 13 went a little cuckoo. But, you know, well, we've been there, done that. There was, You know, we got a little car on the moon. Yeah, People kind of lost faith on it. And... So the space pro program lost some of its energy. They had like Skylab. Well, that was interesting. But then, you know, by the 1980s, it was like, what are we going to do? So they, you know, they had developed the space shuttle. It was a reusable spaceship. And it was very cool. The idea we could launch this sort of space plane into space, take experiments and stuff to build space stations, and then it could land back down and they use it all over again. So, hey, and then everybody got excited about the space program in the 19, early 1980s. And then they kept shooting these things up and people started getting, oh, yeah, there's no, you heard there's a shuttle going, oh, who cares, the shuttle going up. So they wanted to revive the shuttle program. And what better, you know, most of these astronauts are like test pilots. They're like, you know, they're like the hardcore, right stuff kind of guys that fly fighter planes in war. And then we shoot them into space. What if, we shot a civilian into space. What if we took an average person and just shot him into space? What if we shot a teacher into space? Because all this was about getting kids to be excited about the space program and math and science, right? We want kids to be like, yes, I want to learn trigonometry so I can help us get to Mars or Uranus, perhaps. And I'm still waiting to get to Uranus. 
Uh, anyway, so, um, you know, when I was a kid during the Apollo program, every one of those space shots and moon landings, they'd wheel the TV into the classroom and we would all watch like, ah. So they wanted to get kids excited again. So they hooked on this idea of shooting a, a teacher in a space. And they selected this wonderful teacher. Her name was Christy McAuliffe. Uh, and to go up into space in uh, 1986 aboard the Challenger. And they had all these delays. They had all these setbacks. And, you know, they're also the first African-American. Ron McNair was also on that shuttle. Uh, and there were all these pressures. And, every, you know, they kept wheeling the TVs in. And the kids would watch the countdown and then like five, four, stop. No, we're not ready. And I'm like, oh. So it was all this pressure. To, Let's get this teacher in the space. So finally, um, they decided we got to do what we got to do. It. And, these, and these literal rocket scientists, NASA rocket scientists, are like, are we good? Are we good? Are we good? But there was a problem. And the problem was the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle uh, the things that launch this thing out of the Earth's atmosphere had these things called O-rings. And they were just sort of to hold it all together. And it was really, you know, rocket fuel, <laughs> highly explosive stuff. But it was clear that there was a possibility that if the temperature got too cold in Cape Canaveral, Florida, where they launched these things from, that those O-rings might crack. And if the O-rings crack, the rocket fuel could leak out. When the thing ignites, it could blow up the whole rocket. So they'd had a couple really cold uh, mornings. It can get cold in Florida. It can get below freezing. And there, were, there was a possibility that these O-rings would crack. But they went around. They did this check of these 34 uh, NASA uh, executives or uh, NASA administrators. And they're like, you think we're good? You think we're good? The O-rings, everything is good? And group think set in. And they're like, and individually, a lot of them were like, oh, no, no, we can't do this. We can't do this. But collectively, they were thinking, we got to get this teacher up. All these kids are waiting. We can't have another delay. We can't do it uh, again to, you know, all these people who are waiting. Let's go. So even though in their heads they were thinking, it's, it's really risky, they all said, let's do it. And, of course, if you know the story, what happened is, you know, right into the launch. I mean, this was just very dramatic for so many people who are watching, including all these school kids, the, the uh, space shuttle blew up. It blew up on live TV, everybody watching it. School kids were watching it. I mean, I was in graduate school when it happened, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, it was the most dramatic thing to see these people blown to smithereens, and now we know they were probably alive all the way down into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, huge disaster. Mothballed the space program for years, cost billions of dollars, traumatized the people. Uh, who are watching it and uh, cost $3.4 billion initially, three-year delay in the space program, uh, seven astronauts killed, and man. When there was a congressional investigation, what did they found? They found groupthink. They found that individually, these NASA rocket scientists knew they probably shouldn't launch. But when they were in the room together, feeling the external pressure and looking at everybody else, not saying anything, they kept their mouths shut. All right. And so now we have a model of what the risk of group think is. It wasn't bad enough that we were sending innocent people to prison because juries were like, well, nobody else thinks he's innocent. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. This Challenger disaster was so traumatic and so just crippled the nation that now we have this very clear model of what not to do. So if there is a big decision to be made, whether it's a rocket or a jury decision or figuring out where we should go have lunch, um, people will say, all right, we don't want a Challenger disaster. If anybody wants to speak out, don't feel pressured. Right? Speak out. Engage in you know, some bold behavior. Just don't go along. Don't be afraid to rock the vote. Just rock the vote. Rock the vote. You want to rock the vote. Don't rock the vote. Uh, and so we have this as a model now of uh, what not to do. And this is all rooted in the research uh, that started in Paris in the, in the late <laughs> in the late 1800s, uh, looking at people hanging out in salons and looking at small group dynamics. So I just wanted to give you that quick little um, little uh, of many things we could Weber was very interested in this when we talked about democracy, social scientists and people, uh, like Goffman are very interested in these small group dynamics, but the space shuttle notion of, of group think is so important to us when we talk about small group dynamics that it will never be forgotten. Okay, I'm going to get out of this sweaty attic. <laughs>